Well, now, I think if you've been watching this channel for a little bit, you know that I never met a what if project I didn't love. So, uh, I also normally don't work in small scale. I'm a 148 and bigger kind of guy when it comes to aircraft, but sometimes, you know, 172 is a little easier, more convenient to put on a shelf and a little bit cheaper than buying the big guys. And I just happen to have in the stash, going through some stuff, trying to thin it out, um, I have some Hasegawa, some, some good ones, some good 178 scale planes that we don't see very often. So I have some cool what ifs, and uh, we're gonna do a, a series on these ones. And they're all gonna be, they're all gonna kind of relate a little bit, you'll see as we go. Um, so we're gonna see a US Air Force, we're gonna see a US Navy, and something entirely different. But it's still gonna relate, I promise. I'm gonna start with the F-20 Tiger Shark. Now, these are all good kits. Um, I don't think there is a styrene, an injection molded 148 scale X-29. There's probably some resin or, or vacuum formed conversion kits, but for a long time when it came to the F-20, there was this Hasegawa 172, or there was the old Monogram 148. And the Monogram 148 was, was okay, but you know, it had its issues. Number one, big raised panel lines. Uh, number two, some accuracy issues. Um, this little guy is pretty good, and you know, th that's what we had for a long time until Freedom Model came out with a really nice 148 scale modern new tooling F 20 Tiger Shark. And Hasegawa actually borrowed that for their Area 88 series. Uh, they do F, F 20. The F 20 Tiger Shark is a really cool plane. Um, I've done some research on it, you know, um, during my active duty days in the Air Force. I, I looked it up, um, you know, in, in the records and the files that we had. Because number one, it's, it's just a cool looking plane. And you can see the family resemblance to the uh, F5A and E, the Freedom Fighter and the Tiger II lineage there. We're going to talk a little bit about the aircraft because, you know, I like to do a little bit of that education on this channel since, you know, that's spent so much of my, my life and my career um, in the weapons and tactics shop, educating my fellow operators on stuff. On, on how this, on weapon systems, and that's kind of my passion. But, um, you know, the story of the F-20 goes back actually all the way to the 70s, to the mid-70s, um, when the, the F-5A and the F-5E were never intended as, as U.S. military aircraft. We never thought we were gonna fly them, but we did build them as, as cheaper, lighter weight alternatives for all of our allied nations. We did end up using some F-5s in Vietnam, under the Scotia Tiger program. We did end up using the F5Es and Fs, and later the Navy would use the F5N, which is just basically like reclaimed Swiss F5Es, um, as uh, aggressors. The Air Force used the F5E as an aggressor aircraft too because it did have very similar flight characteristics to the MiG-21 in terms of speed and maneuverability, and, and that's kind of what it was matched against out in the world. When, when the Soviets were kind of flooding their Allied Air Forces with the MiG-21, we were offering the F-5 series to our friendlies as a way to go. But, you know, in 1975, they started coming up with what is going to be the next generation of this very successful plane. And at the same time, the United States was, was developing its lightweight fighter program, which would end up with the F-16. And the F-16 was supposed to be much more like the F-5 series than what it would become. That's a whole nother video. Um, the, the Northrop had ended up developing what they would call the F-5G, which because it was so different than the other F-5s, which this is based on, but so modified, they gave it a new designation, the F-20. When the Air Force first started stocking the F-16s, it entered service in the late 70s, 1978. There are a lot of, a lot of export uh, restrictions on that and our allies wanted uh, our newest plane. It was a lot cheaper than the F-15, which most countries couldn't afford. Um, so, you know, the F-20 started to look like a viable solution. Uh, and Northrop really, without anybody asking for it, spun up their, their new design and they said, let's produce some and let's offer it to the world and say, hey, we've got, we've got something that can match the F-16 
and uh, maybe even save you a few bucks. And if the U.S. is going to export this new F-16 fighter around the world, you know, we really only offered it to a handful of countries. Here's something that you guys can, can have. So in 1982, the Air Force uh, approved the designation of F-20 Tiger Shark for, well, I should say they approved the designation of F-20. 1983, they approved the name Tiger Shark, and they said to Northrop, go for it. You can, you can start your, your sales pitch for this. And the Air Force kind of said to, well, maybe we'll take a look at it. But the problem was for Northrop at this point. When Reagan took over from Carter in uh, 1981, he started to really relax a lot of those export restrictions that the Carter administration had imposed. Um, the F-16 was a very successful aircraft, and it was what the U.S. Air Force was, was running with. And the thing is, when you've got a, a, a successful design that the U.S. Air Force is buying in high numbers and had already decided to export to some of its best allies, um, and then you've got this other design that the Air Force wasn't interested in, that everybody knew was based off of a plane that the Air Force, that the U.S. government kind of had a company design just for exporting to allies. Um, they said, well, wait a minute, why would we get this when we could buy the F-16? But the thing is, the F-20 was an excellent tactical fighter. It had a lot of advantages. And, uh, you know, it just kind of politically and and by reputation, the, the F-20 did what it did very well. It might have been a step or two down from the F-16 in some ways, but in a lot of ways, um, it might have even performed a little bit better. And the Air Force never really allowed a full-on head-to-head fly-off competition between the F-20 and the F-16. And I think it's because they were a little afraid of what the results would be. Um, but the the cold start to afterburner takeoff time of the F-20 was a matter of mere minutes. From sitting on the ground to the alarm going off, the pilot jumping in it, within just a few minutes, they could have this rolling down the runway in full afterburner and off the ground. Um, it made uh, extensive use of composite materials for construction. Um, the, you know, the, the wing plan have it being lowered down to the ground meant an easier access for ground crews to rearm and turn it around on a mission. Um, it was a little easier to service because it was a lower to the ground aircraft. That also restricted some of the stores it could carry because the F-16 just has more clearance under the wings for, for bigger bomb loads. Uh, the F-16 also has two more underwing stations than the F-20 does. Uh, but you know, the F-20 was a very good fighter aircraft with a very good radar in it. Um, it actually had a slightly more advanced radar than the original F-16's APG-66. It had the APG-67. It could employ the AM-7 Sparrow and it was seen carrying mock-ups of the AIM-120 AMRAAM pre-production model. So uh, there are a lot of folks in the Air Force that were of the opinion that uh, the Air Force might have lost out by not allowing some F-20s into service. That a lot of countries missed out by not picking up the F-20. And ultimately only a couple of them were built and um, you know, there were some air show crashes during demonstrations, and that basically killed the whole F-20 project. Uh, but the F-20 was was an excellent aircraft, you know, all around. It just was, by the time the F-16 had, had gotten traction in the, the tactical fighter world, there was just, nobody was going to buy the plane that the Air Force had no interest in, you know? It was great what might have been. I've, I've modeled a handful of them of what might they have looked like in Air Force service, and we're going to do another one. Um, except this time, I got my hands on some great modern-day 64th Aggressor Squadron decals. So we're going to do this one as an Air Force Aggressor at Nellis Air Force Base. Now, the Aggressors are the professional bad guys um, of Weapon School, which is a school I have graduated from. And I'm very proud of, kind of the crown jewel in my career. And But then, the Aggressors also... Uh, are the professional bad guys for red flag exercises. And red flag is a multinational, um, multi-week, um, very intense, one of the most realistic air combat exercises in the world. Uh, the Air Force takes part, we invite our allied nations, the Navy comes to play sometimes, both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground engagements. And uh, it's, 
it's it's a it's a brutally tough air to air fight, and and it also does involve some ground forces. Um, sometimes, you know, the Air Force's battlefield airmen will play in those exercises on the ground, calling in airstrikes and combat rescue and uh, stuff like that. So anyway, uh, the aggressors are pretty well known. I pr probably shouldn't have to introduce them to anybody. So this kit is pretty well detailed for a 172 kit. We've got some very nicely done panel lines all across here. Uh, detail is, you know, about on par for a 172 scale aircraft, especially a Hasegawa. We've got some good decals going on in for the cockpit, and we're going to use it. We're going to build it out of the box, basically, with a couple little modifications just to help us out there. Um, but we've got the instruments for the cockpit. Uh, we have a mostly realistic. Uh, seat. Where is it? There it is. Uh, I mean, it's not too special, um, but again, it's 172 scale. We might we might put a little scratch building in there just for some seat harnesses and stuff. We've got a decent pilot figure. Uh, I know it's going to get drowned out a little. The detail might get drowned out a little bit by the lights, but when we put some color on on there, some paint, you'll see decent clear parts. Um, you know, some of the other Hasegawa larger models have that seam down the middle. You have to get rid of. We have no such seam here. Um, luckily, we have uh, we have pylons that have fuel tanks attached, but we also have clean pylons, which is what we need because I've got some accessory sets here, and um, this one happens to have ACMI pods, which we need for a uh, an aggressor. Um, it also has some very decent late model sidewinders, which we can turn to CADMs, captive air training missiles. But this set right here has something special. This has the ALQ-188 pod, which aggressor aircraft use to simulate. And that's this guy here. You'll see it put together. It's got some antenna that stick out. Aggressor aircraft use that to simulate electronic emissions from other aircraft. You might see that on uh, F-16s or uh, some, they can also, they, we've also seen them used in, in kind of a combat role, but, um, but let's get going. Standard, standard work in the cockpit first. So let's go.
The seat really lacks detail, but we've got a decent pilot for this scale. He'll look good in the cockpit. You won't get a real close-up look at him anyway since we're doing it canopy closed. Not bad though. The kit doesn't call for any nose weight, but if I can ever squeeze some in there, I always like to. Just to be sure, some kits don't tell you you need the weight, but you end up with a tail sitter if you don't put it in. So I added one little fishing weight just to be sure. One of the really nice things about this kit is that you can line up these fuselage halves so that there's really minimal sanding of any seam line. It fits together really, really well for a kit this age and for a kit in this scale. A lot of times um, you, you have, like I've said before, just real minimal detail work on it, but this goes together really, really nicely. Now, through the little sanding that I did have to do, I lost a little of the panel line detail, so I'm putting it back on just with a hobby knife because I want to make sure I keep the nice, small, shallow and thin panel line detail that comes with the rest of the kit. use the Mr. Dissolve putty just to fill in the little holes where the pylons would have mounted to. Alright, now we need to do a little scratch work. You can see here this is what's supposed to be the HUD, I guess, um, but we need, we need to add a HUD for it to be a realistic fighter. So I'm going to sand this flat a little bit to give us a kind of a better base to work with to start. Since the kit doesn't come with a HUD, no glass piece for that, we're just going to use the flat part here on the clear part sprue to make ourselves one that'll fit right there in the instrument combing. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use this flat plastic to build just a, a flat base here on top to mount the actual HUD onto.
we're switching back and forth between the HUD work and the canopy because we need to make sure that as we cut the HUD piece out and angle it, it fits within the confines of the canopy. You'll see I built a little bit of a structure for the HUD to sit on there, out of clear plastic, and that'll be our actual HUD piece. In this scale, for what we'll see through the actual closed canopy, I think it works out pretty good. This all black scheme is called Wraith. It's one of the more popular new aggressor paint schemes. They use it at Nellis and they also use it in Alaska with the 18th Aggressor Squadron. So we can do an all black base of uh, Al Alclad primer and then we can just seal clear right over that and we've basically got our paint job done. We'll use the white for the interior areas, landing gear wells and such. And then we'll just add a couple extra colors on top as we need to.
I guess I deleted the clip where I show the bottle. This is just, to me, an X20 clear acrylic gloss so we can uh, seal in the work we've done and get to decaling. This is the decal set by Pro Decals. I found it on eBay. It's actually a very complete decal set. I have not used their stuff before, but the decals were pretty good. A little thick in terms of carrier film for this scale, but the decals were all printed very nicely, very crisp, very clear, and uh, I enjoyed working with them. I would use them again. Standard decal solutions, I always use Microset before the decal, followed by Microsol immediately after, and then Sol the set uh, about 24 hours after that, just to make sure all the decals are nice, snug, wrinkle-free, and as close to painted on looking as we can possibly get. Whenever I use decals meant for one subject on a different subject, I'm always looking for some kind of natural landmarking, panel lines, or features of the aircraft to use to not only place them in some kind of natural looking location, but to make sure that I can place them symmetrically on both sides of the aircraft. For example, the, the tail flash here. The F-16 and the F-20 have some features of similar size, so these markings actually do translate really well from one aircraft to another. I love putting the refueling receptacle markings on the spine of the F-20 to look like an F-16, but in truth the F-20 had no refueling receptacle, it had a removable probe for Navy style probe and drogue refueling.
I've said in a previous video, 172 is not my most comfortable scale to build in. And it's still not. But these Hasagawa models are very inexpensive. They're a lot of fun to work with. They're very available. So it's almost irresistible, you know, the possibility of getting my hands on them and, and just doing fun projects with them. And I'm not gonna lie, mistakes were made putting this one together. Um, I, you know, I normally do 148. That's, that's my aircraft scale. And I need to improve working on these 172 scale ones. So as I was going through this, you know, I was working off of various um, photographs and information I had regarding the ghost scheme. And, you know, when, when you spend time at Nellis and, and you see ghost, it's, it's, a very, it's a very matte finish. And I was using my, my best tools to do that matte finish. So Windsor & Newton is the mattest matte, flattest flat I've ever worked with. Unfortunately, it ends up kind of, especially with this one, it, I don't know how to describe it. It, it kind of, it's a very flat finish, but I feel like it muted, it muted the black color a little bit. The actual Wraith, did I just call it Ghost? I think I did. The actual Wraith F-16 is a very pronounced, very deep black color. Um, not this sort of fainted out finish that we have here, which, which I'm a little upset about. But um, if you were to look up, you know, actual pictures of the Wraith painted aircraft after going through a full red flag or weapon school um, you know, course w where they where they put in all the time. You will see these actual, you know, the the Nevada dirt and dust in some of the panel line. Uh, like I said, it's a little overdone, a little bit, especially you know, scale effect. But it really does sort of match what I was looking for. So I, you know, overall I'm happy. I just I've got a lot of work to do, bringing my 172 scale game up to meet my 148 scale and I know that and I'll, and I'll and I'll work on that but it's just such a fun project I really really enjoyed it you know the markings really do I mean they really do translate well if you take a look you know sized for the F16 they translate so well to the F20 because they really are a similar size different shapes very different shapes but because the sizing is so similar, they just go so well from one airframe to another. When it comes to loadout, we've got a very simple but standard aggressor load here. So we've got the ALQ-188 sitting center line, which allows aircraft, and it's not just on aggressors. So uh, when I was stationed at Tyndall, where we were training uh, new F-22 pilots, the 43rd Fighter Squadron. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't in the 43rd, but I'm saying um, the T-38s flown by the, uh, well, it changed names. It was the 325th Support, you know, Operational Support Squadron, and then it was the 2nd Fighter Training Squadron. And anyway, they flew T-38s that the F-22s would, would fly against. Not They weren't an actual aggressor squadron, but they were uh, basically all the, all the, all the uh, colonels that had desk duty. But in order to keep their flight hours up, they would fly these T-38s, you know, once a month um, as, as red air for the, for the F-22s. But they would, they would carry these pods because obviously the T-38s had electronic level zero. Um, but the ALQ-188 can replicate a number of electronic signatures um, and some jamming and, and some other stuff. And so the aggressors carry it so they can replicate what, you know, you might see in, in various uh, electronic sensors and, and such and threat receivers to look like an enemy. And um, so it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool pod. And there have been some uh, some work related to that recently, and the ALQ one 
67, which is an old Navy pod, called, uh, it's actually called the Angry Kitten. The Air Force is using it, which is like an AI-driven pod to automatically um, to automatically go through jamming profiles and, and electronic responses. Uh, anyway, that's sorry, that's off topic. Of course, if you're going to be flying over the ranges at Nellis, you've got to have an ACM iPod, Air Combat Maneuvering Instrumentation. That's what basically lets you uh, sit in the debrief and evaluate every maneuver the airplane makes, and they use that to determine basically who wins in air, in the simulated air combat. It, it's a very it's a very nifty. Like sitting through those debriefs is amazing. Um, and incredibly boring, mostly boring, but, um, you know, that's how you track the airplane. It tracks every metric and then they can, uh, figure out, you know, missile shots are valid or not and all that other stuff. So this is the, this represents the, uh, cubic version, uh, it's a company manufacturer of the, uh, ASQT-50. Um, there are different manufacturers and different models. Um, I, you know, I, the Hasegawa kit, that's what this comes from, uh, actually represents a Navy pod, which some, you can find on some aircraft, on some Air Force aircraft, but traditionally, you know, the, the Air Force is a little different. So I had to basically use different markings, um, and, and the, the Hasegawa decals are perfect wraparound, um, cruciform, so they're even on all four sides this is sloppy as hell and they're not the real markings that would go on there but they they represent they look kind of like the serial number markings from a distance um it's yeah meh it's the closest i could get don't look at it it's ugly and then to balance it out on the other side we've got a ballasted um captive air training round so You'll see these in different flavors. Basically, when when you have this uh, this whole blue, a lot of times you'll find it looks it looks like you know a live sidewinder, but it's uh, just got the blue bands rather than the the brown and yellow to represent live warhead and motor. This blue body means that it is just basically a complete dummy tube. It's just weighted to sit on the wing, um, and. It's got, uh, it doesn't have its roller-ons on the fins. It's just a basically a solid cap there. But what it does have is an actual live seeker so that the pilot can use that to actually target, you know, an enemy that's flying around. I like the way they look, basically. Um, there, are, there are different, you know, just different models of, of CADMs. One of the other things I'm really not happy about is uh, the way that the cockpit ended up looking. Um, uh, you know, I I, I should have I should have done something a little bit different here with the seat and the rails. I don't know. I just didn't anticipate how that was going to look uh, with that blank spot there. I haven't I haven't. I I don't know. You know what? Like I said, some mistakes were made. I'm not I'm not entirely happy with this. Uh, on a shelf from 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 yay far it's it's gonna look it's gonna look pretty good i did some areas you know to represent where logically some ecm fairings should be um in my in my estimation anyway you know where you'd want to have maybe some radar warning receivers and and such uh on an actual you know combat version of the f-20 um, I just love the F twenty. It it was a it was a great aircraft. It just it, if you really look into the specs and you really look into what it was capable of, you know, I think the world the world missed out. It it really it could have been great. You know, we we just the thing is we never we the, all we saw was like the original base model, the the original design. You know, the F sixteen came out and and has been modified and enhanced for for forty years. Imagine how great and how much more powerful the F-20 might have been after 40 years of enhancements and modifications and upgrades. I mean, but that's that's just me being a geek. So anyway, I'm really curious. I, I'm I'm a little I'm a little nervous too, you know, because uh, like I said, 
again, mistakes were made, but I'd love your feedback on this one, folks, uh, and see what you think of it. Thanks for uh, sticking with me through the build and all the process. I really do welcome your input on this and your, your criticism where it, uh, where it is justly deserved. There'll be another project coming out real soon. And for all of you building your own out in YouTube land, remember, keep building them, build them well. I'll see you with the next video real soon.